If you're excited about Jesus Christ, let me hear you say, hey, praise God, amen. We're a Christ-centered organization, and we want to see lives change. And we know that the gospel of Jesus Christ is where life change happens. Reaching the hard to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to see you raise your kids in the church house and not the dope house. Amen. We're in James chapter 1. We're going through the book of James verse by verse. If you would stand to honor God's word if you can. James 1. We'll start in verse 5. We're going to read 5 through 8. James says, the Bible says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all freely or liberally, without reproach. It will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. He who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven by the wind. Tossed and driven by the wind. For let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. What can the doubter expect to receive from God? The Bible says nothing. He's a double-minded man. Unstable in all his ways. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your written word. I thank you, Lord, for these people who are here tonight. I pray for the power of God to manifest here tonight. I pray that your spirit would move on somebody. I pray for the hardest heart in this room to be cracked wide open, God. I pray for the the most vile sinner in this room to become uh, an evangelist through this message, God. That you would reach down to the heart of these people, Lord. And you would stir their hearts and convict them and draw them. And help me preach like a dying man to a dying people. Help me be brave tonight and bold and unafraid. And I give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. The other day, the weather snowed us in. It was my wife and I and uh, my little buddy Raxton, he was there, and, and uh, my baby Z, baby Zinley was there, and Keith was there, and, and I thought, man, I seen somebody on Facebook po- post a picture, and they was making beef stew, and I said, man, that looks good, and so I opened up my refrigerator, and I said, I wonder if we got what it takes to make some beef stew, and, and, and so it was snowing everywhere, and, and I opened up the refrigerator, and there was some beef, and, and, and there were some vegetables, and I opened up the freezer, you know, I ain't afraid to eat nothing, and and, uh, and then I'm pulling out the frozen peas and this and that, and, and I got to cooking the beef stew, and, and then I realized I was missing beef broth. And I told my wife, I said, uh, we're missing something here tonight. We're missing an ingredient. I need that one thing to make this, this stew perfect. I, I need that one thing to make it into perfection. You say, why, why am I telling you about Beef stew, beef stew, and actually, I I didn't have to go get chicken broth. I I worked something else out because my mom raised me on a, a, you know she could make a meal out of a out of a out of a out of a bag of Jiffy Mix. You know what I'm talking about? And so uh, we figured it out and it went good. But but the point I'm trying to make tonight is James is writing, and the theme of the book of James is maturity, and he's go, he's talking about trials, and as James. The beginning of the book of James, he goes right into it. He doesn't, he doesn't, it's not a normal greeting in a, in a, in a letter. He, and he's kind of, it's, it's, he picks up on wisdom themes because he was a very strong Jew and ran the Jewish church. And so a lot of the things he said comes from some of the Hebrew writings that are uh, extra biblical writings. And in and, and, and James, he says, if any man is, is in a trial, he says, it counted all joy when you fall into various trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And then he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, if you don't understand how valuable a trial is, and he goes into verse 5, and and he begins to talk about you need wisdom. Verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, wisdom to what? Count your trial as joy. It takes wisdom. (laughs) A missing ingredient is wisdom. A missing ingredient is faith. He must ask in faith with no doubting. So what's, holding, what's the ingredient in my trial tonight? What's the ingredient holding me back from being a mature Christian? He's writing this letter to Christian people. This is to the Christian folk in the room tonight. What is it that you're missing in your trial that holds you back from growing in the Lord? Faith and wisdom. Faith. And wisdom. Verse 4. But let patience have its perfect work. The word perfect is mature. 
that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Warren Wearsby says it this way. Warren Wearsby says, knowledge is the ability to take things apart and faith and, and wisdom is the ability to put things back together again. <laughs> knowledge is the ability to take things apart and wisdom is the ability to put things back together. So as James talks about spiritual maturity, he's going to teach the church how valuable their trials are and what they've been going through. Do you understand the value of your trial tonight? As a Christian, do you understand how valuable your trial is? Some of you tonight need wisdom. You need the wisdom of God. Some of you feel like throwing in the towel and quitting on God right now. There are Christians listening to the sound of my voice and you're facing things no one else knows about. You look good on the outside. You go to church. You give. You serve. But there's something going on in your life and, and you're ready to quit. You feel like God's not listening anymore. There are people listening to the sound of my voice tonight who know Jesus and your body is falling apart right now. You're aching tonight. You're in a trial. Your friends seem to be disappearing. Some of you just got saved. Some of you got out of prison. And, and, and right now you don't have no old friends anymore. And you're having trouble making new ones. And you're thinking, why? It'd be so easy just to go back into that old life again. Some of you have been sucker punched right in the face by life tonight. <laughs> the Bible teaches God's truth. As we look through the Word of God, the Holy Spirit helps us discern God's truth. And wisdom helps us apply it. <laughs> what do I need? I need God's Word. I need the Holy Spirit to give me discernment to understand it. And I need wisdom to help me apply it to my life. Patience gives you the ability to wait on God. But patience only comes through trials. Can't have it without a trial. You say, I don't want patience. I don't want to pray for patience. Then you'll never learn to wait on the Lord. But then you have wisdom in the middle of this thing. He speaks about wisdom, gives you the ability to understand that there's something good coming from your trial. Where do I find wisdom? Do I find wisdom in school? Do I find wisdom from friends, philosophies of the world? No, but God. There's only one place to find wisdom, and that is God Almighty. I don't know if we get this thing going or not, but we're going to try. I didn't even turn it on. I'm getting fired up. And the whole earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his mind. Look at that. Psalm 51, 6. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. It's beautiful. Okay, Kurt Richards says this. Nope, he doesn't say that. I'm going to say it anyway. However poor, however ignorant, however mistaken or confused the believer may be, they are always commanded to pray for wisdom. The doubter doesn't pray for wisdom. <laughs> That's how you know. The man of faith prays for wisdom. So as we look through the scripture tonight and as we go through the text and we learn what's the missing ingredient in my life to mature me. I'm in a trial. I'm going through trials right now in my life. I'm facing hardships and difficulties right now. And, and so what is it? The first thing is is faith. I don't know where that's at. We'll find it in a minute. Don't even worry about it. I messed it up. Faith. Without faith, you can't do anything with God. Amen? Faith. Five and six, James just got done letting these believers know that their trial and their suffering was good. And it was going to purify that faith that needed to be tried and tested. And, and remember, when something's purified, it increases the value of it. And so James is saying that, that he's not testing your faith to see if you have faith. He's testing your faith to purify the faith that you already have. And so you need wisdom to understand that that trial, that that thing is needed in your life. And, and if you don't recognize the value of your trial, then you need to pray in faith for wisdom. What is this faith? Is this faith in freeway ministries? No. Is this faith in programs? Is this faith in people? 
Is this faith in philosophy, in my job, faith in my family, faith in society, faith in government, faith in church membership, faith in baptism? No. I went to visit some guys in jail the other day. And uh, I was sitting across from a guy that sat here in this ministry many, many, many times for years. He's come here. And he's lost his wife and his kids and uh, been a knucklehead. And I went up there and I sat across the glass from him in that, in, that, in that visiting room three days ago. And as I talked to him, through the conversation, this is what he said to me. He said, my wife is my rock. I said, your wife can't be your rock, man. Your kids can't be your rock. The reason those things can't be your rock is because those things are imperfect. The rock is what you build on. The rock, is, the rock can't move. The rock can't budge. The rock can't shake. The rock has to be consistent. The rock has to be the same every single day. And, and, and as I looked at him and I talked to him, I said, listen, sir, she can't be your rock because she's inconsistent and she's imperfect. When she moves, you move. When she changes, you change. When she lets you down, you go down. And for some reason, when life happens and she's gone because she dies or she divorces you or she runs off, who knows what could happen? Everything's going to fall apart. But listen to me tonight. The only consistent thing that never changes is God and the truth found inside this holy book that I have in my hand. And this is what we build our foundation on. God's Word. Listen, don't tell me God told you to tell me anything. Come up with the Bible and show me the address where the book's at. Because this is what we base our foundation on. God's Word. His holy truth we got to build on it. What does it say about me? What's its promises for me? What's he say about obedience and disobedience? What's he love? How do I worship him? How do I know him? Oh, God, if he can change a filthy sinner like me in a dirty prison cell, he can raise you up to walk in the newness of life right now. He's good. His truth. So, so we need to figure out what he says and what it says and let its truth be our foundation. The verbal link between 4 and 5 says that these scriptures run together. This is not 4. 5 through 8 is not a separate subject. 5 through 8 comes from 2 through 4. And, and the scripture is a verbal link in, in, the, in the language. It means it links it together. And so when you read this scripture, it's actually right off of the trial. It's tied together. He's saying the fire is meant to, to make you stop placing your faith in things that can't be your rock. <laughs> Some of you are, are, are falling apart. Your life is a wreck and it's because you're trying to build your foundation on things that are shaky. You've got a new love of your life tonight. That, that love of your life, if it's your foundation, is going to leave you high and dry once again. It's not the next new drug. It's not the next new party. Your rock is something that can't shake, can't move, can't change, can't budge. That's consistent no matter what comes your way. That's where our faith lies. Today the missing ingredient is faith. Faith in what? Faith in faith? Faith in what I say about Jesus? Faith in God's promises. Faith in God's promises. That's where my faith lies tonight. In His promises. God's Word, His promises. My faith want, must be 100% directed towards what God's Word says. God's Word says what is right. God's Word says what is not right. God's Word says what is, how to get right. God's Word says how to stay right. If I want to know what's right in my life, I go to the book. The book. If I want to know what's, what, what's not right in my life, I go to the book. If I want to know how to get right, I go to the book. If I want to know how to stay right, I go to the book. It's not what society says. Society is not my standard. Society is not my, my tape measurer tonight. If I want to use a tape measure, I want it to be consistent. The Bible's consistent. Man, God's Word. That's where my faith lies. What does it say? It says my trial is valuable. It says my trial is good. It says count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith is producing patience. Let patience have its perfect work that you may be complete, perfect, lacking no good thing. That's the Bible. That's what it says. Faith is active, 
Not lip service. You can say you have faith. You can say you believe in God. Later James says even the, belie- even the demons believe in God. Even the demons fear and tremble more than most Baptists I'm, I know. I'm Baptist, so it's okay to say that. <laughs> but what happens when tragedy comes? What happens when crisis hits your life? I'm going to tell you something that's going to make somebody mad, but that's okay because you're probably mad already. God never said you stay healthy, sir. God never said you stay healthy. You take that health and wealth naming and claiming stuff and you throw it in the trash can on the way out of here because it's garbage. God never said your marriage would be perfect. God never said that. God never promised you a life free from tragedy. God never said that. God never promised you'd have a big fat bank account for the rest of your life. Somebody in this room has had life sucker punch them right in the face. And right now, you're ready to quit on God because your faith is built on something other than the Word of God. Run, boy. I made ED as I whoo. <laughs> Amen? Amen. There are people listening to the sound of my voice. You're here tonight. You know Jesus, but you're in a situation that's painful. You're looking up at God and you're saying, Where are you at, God? I'm going to give you something to chew on, Christian. If my faith, if I have faith in God tonight, if you're a Christian, you say you have faith in God. So when you're walking in faith, where's your faith directed? Towards God. Would you agree with that? Amen. So tonight, if you, have, if you say you have faith, and your faith is in God, and you're a Christian, don't you miss this. God gave me this nugget. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to try to explain it like, like I've seen it today as I studied. Hopefully I won't mess it up. So when I have faith, and I'm walking in faith, the Bible says walk in faith, not by, li- not by sight. Faith means life, live. This is how I'm living my life. I'm walking by faith. So when I'm walking by faith, my faith is directed towards God. So when I'm walking by doubt, where's my doubt directed? Towards God. <laughs> if I'm walking by doubt, the enemy of faith, I'm doubting God. That's where your doubt goes. If you're a Christian tonight and you're walking by faith and tragedy happens and you start doubting, who are you doubting? You're not doubting yourself. Not if you walk walking by faith and you're a Christian. God's looking at you tonight and he's saying, are you holding on to my promises? Are you trusting me? Are you walking by faith? Why are you not committed anymore because of tragedy? Why are you not committed anymore because the, the bad things happen? We memorize scripture that make us feel good about our flesh. But we forget all the ones about suffering. Why, why don't you remember those? There's as many in the Bible or more. We, we, we're selfish. But when we walk by faith, we walk by faith in God. When we walk by doubt, we walk by doubt in God. And James said, you need wisdom to understand no matter how bad this thing is in your life right now, it's good for you. Because you belong to God. In the context of sufferings, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. All things all tragedies, all car wrecks, all violent acts, all, all deaths, all sicknesses, the sword, the peril. Paul said, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Neither principalities, powers, high things, low things, no other created things. No, I am persuaded that not even the angels can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's scripture in the context of suffering. So tonight, look up at God and say, God, I'll be in it as long as you want me to be, but don't let me miss the value of it. I want to walk by faith and not by sight. I think I went ahead of myself. Since faith is always a matter of personal trust in God, to doubt God in any way is to call His character into question. Look what it says. In actuality, of course, doubting calls your character into question, not his. So we've talked about what we need. What do we need? In, what do we need? What's the missing ingredient? The missing ingredient is faith. The missing ingredient is wisdom. 
Doubt is the ingredient you don't need. It's probably the worst slide I've ever created. Not good at that. <clears throat> uh, my mom called me a, a human garbage disposal growing up. <clears throat> I'd eat anything. I've been hungry. You've been hungry before? I got a kid at home, and he is so picky, man. And it, I'm like, man, I know you're mine because I was DNA tested, brother, but you sure don't act like it, man. <laughs> you know? The way you eat, I've been hungry. I was hungry. I didn't even know what a budget was growing up. That wasn't even a word I've ever heard in my life, man. And uh, we used to have the food stamps, you know, the, the paperback ones. I put mine in a money clip and go to the store. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I was doing something. You buy something for a few pennies and then you get that change back. Everybody goes in with a dollar. You know what I mean? Uh, anyway, I'm sorry. I got sidetracked. When I was in prison, I realized that there was a food I didn't like. And the food, the food I don't like is hominy. I hate it. I remember being in prison. I was on $5 a month in prison. Five post of stamps, a stick of deodorant, and a stick of toothpaste. I was hungry. And my cellie was David Hutman. Some of you might know him. He, uh, and he used to get mad at me because I eat anything anybody didn't touch because I didn't have no store. I was hungry. And uh, he'd be my cell with me. You could do the math on that. But um, <clears throat> I would try to get the hominy. I'd, I'd give me some of that hominy. Nobody wants it, right? And then I'd try to make myself eat it because it would fill my stomach up, and I was hungry, and I couldn't finish it. And then, and then I'd try again a, few, a little bit later. I'd mix it with something on my plate. I'd put it with the mashed potatoes or uh, try to mix it up, and I hated it. And I realized that there's one thing I don't like. It's hominy. I hate hominy. If I'm making beef stew, the one ingredient I'm not going to put in it is hominy. <laughs> hominy is doubt. To me, doubt's something you don't need. Doubt's something that's not your friend. Faith's from God. Faith's from God. Wisdom's from God. Doubt's not from God. What else ain't from God? Discouragement. Discouragement's the trickiest tool of the, of the devil. It's the one you don't realize is his. Some of you tonight are believers and you're walking in this place and you're so discouraged you can't hold your head up. You need to realize that's not from God. The promise of wisdom is only for those who have faith. He says the one who doubts shouldn't think he'll receive anything from the Lord. Doubt hinders your prayer. Doubt holds you back. Tonight there are people that are doubting. Doubt is standing between you and your answered prayer tonight. Doubt is standing between you and wisdom from God tonight. We give this altar call in a little while. I'm going to encourage you to respond. Say, God, remove the doubt from me. Help me trust you. Help me believe. Help me walk by faith and not by sight. And if you'll notice that James, as he makes this comparison, look what it says in, in verse 6. Uh, it says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave in the sea, tossed by the waves, by the wind. Let that man not suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. For that man is, is, is double-minded and unstable, don't you miss this, in all his ways, in all he does. The doubter is like the sea, driven by the wind. Why would he use that analogy? I looked through this and I studied this. I did a lot of work on this. And here's my conclusion. When you think of the sea and you think of the wind and the waves, what comes to your mind? It's never the same. It's never the same. It's consistently inconsistent. The doubter is consistently inconsistent. Like the sea. Like the waves. It's clear one day, praise God. It comes back and it's not clear. It's murky and it's murky the next day. The sea's up one minute and it's down the next minute. There are people listening to the sound of my voice and you are consistently inconsistent with God tonight. I'm talking to Christian people. I don't expect lost people to act like saved people. I'm talking about saved people tonight. People who know Jesus. One minute you're up, the next minute you're down. One minute you're in the Bible every day, the next minute you don't read your Bible anymore. 
One minute you're in the church, you're going to join the church, you're going to get involved in church, and the next minute you don't go to church, you don't want to go to church. One minute you're trusting God and you're making commitments to God and you're making promises to God, and the next minute you don't trust God, you're not making commitments to God, and you're breaking all your promises to God. You give something to God and you say, God, here it is, I'm not taking it back, and the next minute you take it back from God. Consistently inconsistent. The doubter. He's double-minded. She's double-minded. In all her ways. In all his ways. James describes this person as double-minded. Here's a nugget tonight for the Bible nerd. The literal word for double-minded is not, this is not found, this is, this is the first time it's been coined in the Greek language. It's Hebrew. James takes it from the Hebrew. He changes, he puts it in the Greek, and this is what he's saying. A soul and a soul. That's what it means. A soul and a soul. What's he saying? You're a different person every day. You're two people. You're not the same person every day. That's the downer. That's the Christian who walks by doubt. You're two people. I'm not trying to pick on nobody tonight. I'm just keeping it real. I'm preaching the word. I don't want to be two people. I don't want to be a different person with God when everything's going good than I am when everything hits me in the face. I don't want to, I don't want to let my commitments to God break because of the circumstances in my life. Mike A., he serves here. One time he lost his job at, at, at UPS because of a, something they said he did that he didn't do. And they have their own court hearing and they have their own, UPS is like the mafia. I'm not trying to be mean or anything, but they're, they are, man. They, 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 got, they got their own court, their own everything and he was going to court he lost his job without without pay and and his daughter had these braces on her face i'll never forget this testimony as long as i live i'll use it for the rest of my life and and the braces were spreading and she had to go to the doctor and have them things taken off in a certain amount of time it's gonna mess her teeth up his insurance was gone i'm watching this guy man i'm thinking well is he gonna crack the last three people that went to court for the thing they accused him of lost their job. He comes into Crossway Baptist Church. He's covered in towel. He's been working in towel. He got him another job. He's on church on Wednesday night. He's got, he's got that, I'm not a construction guy, but he's got that caulk and stuff all in his big thick hair, all over his arms and on his head, all over his shirt. And he's walking in with his Bible in his hand. He's praising the Lord, worshiping God. You would have never known he lost his job. His commitment to God never changed. If there's one person in my life who's my friend and will always be the same person, it's Mike A. Guess what happened? He got his job back. And he, now he drives that truck all over town. He still does the same stuff he always does. Shares the gospel with everybody he meets. Praise the Lord. I don't want to be a man of one thing. I want to have integrity in my life. I don't want to be double-minded. I want to be consistent with God. I want to be faithful to God. I don't want to have spiritual schizophrenia. I'm not trying to be funny. But that's what this is, guys. When you're a different person around the, your, your homies, and a different person when you come to church, when you're a different person around your family at the family reunion, you're a different person when you come to church, when you're a different person when you get your paycheck, and a different person when the money's gone, when you're a different person when church says, I'll help you with your light bill, and you become a different person when they say, we don't have the funding, you have spiritual schizophrenia. You're double-minded. You're two people. I want to be one man. My whole life I've been inconsistent. My whole life I've been a chameleon and f just f a fraud growing up. Just using people and wanting to get high and use drugs and live my life that way. And what can I get out of this person? How can I manipulate this person? When I got saved, I made a commitment to God not to turn back and change. And I promised God, I'll be the same man every day. I'll read my Bible every day. I'll pray every day. I'll seek you every day. I want to encourage somebody tonight. Stop being two people. Stop being two people. Because you can't serve two masters. You'll either hate one and love the other, or you'll love one and hate the other. You'll be faithful to one and, and unfaithful to the other. There is no middle ground with God. You want to be used by God? 
Surrender your life to God like you did the dope bag. Commit yourself to God like you did the dope game. Submit to Him. Say, God, use me like the drugs used me. I want to make you my God. I want to serve you. Use me, God. When we allow doubt to creep in as Christians, we act like lost people. We act just like lost people. Isaiah 57, 20 says, But to the wicked, the wicked are like tossing, like the tossing sea. Listen to that. Isaiah 57, 20. But the wicked are like the tossing sea. For it can't be quiet. Its waters toss up mire and dirt. That's the same comparison to what James is saying right here. And the biggest cause for doubt in the Christian life is unmet expectations from God. We expect from God what He doesn't promise us. And when He doesn't give it to us, we change. Verse 7, let that man not to expect that he would receive anything from the Lord. Why do you think he says that? Because he's in a trial and he's trying to get out of it. Stop trying, try, stop trying to get out of your trial. Stop trying to get out of your trial tonight. God doesn't ever say get, pray to get out. Instead of saying, oh God, I want to get out of this trial, change your prayer to this. Oh God, what can I get out of this trial? I'm in this thing because you're changing me tonight. You're purifying my faith. You're burning up the things that I've been putting my faith in that don't, that don't belong to you. My relationship's burning up because God don't want it to be there anymore. My job's burning up because he wants me not to put faith in my job. My money's funny because God wants me to stop putting faith in my money. All these things are gone where you're at, just you and God. A broken and contrite spirit, oh God, you will not despise. So that's what James is teaching us tonight. That's what the scripture teaches. I'm reminded of Abraham. Abraham was a man who God made a promise to that sounded crazy. And Abraham even laughed at God. Abraham was 100 years old and God said, I'm going to give you a child with your wife who's 90. He laughed. But he still walked in, a, in, a, in, in faith. He still walked in faith. Abraham fell on his face and laughed. You say, where's the verse that? I'm glad you asked. Genesis 17, 18. Literally. He fell on his face. Ha, 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 ha. I got my silver sneaker discounted at, 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 the, at the gym, man. I'm 100 years old. You're going to give me a child. But he still believed God. He laughed and he trusted at the same time. Did he doubt? He questioned the promises of God, but he walked in obedience to it. Doubt stops us from walking in obedience to God. Romans 4.19. He did not weaken in his faith. Abraham, Romans 4.19, he did not weaken in his faith, but can, he considered his own body dead, which was as good as dead since he was 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of his wife's womb, verse 20, don't you forget this verse, Romans 4, verse 20, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promises of God. What's the word waver mean? Doubt. Same word. Same word. And my last point, hopefully I'll have it on the screen. Pray for wisdom tonight. Pray for wisdom. Why pray for wisdom in a trial? Because God doesn't say pray for strength. God doesn't say pray for a way out. He says pray for wisdom. How is it possible for me tonight to see something painful and something that brings suffering in my life is valuable without wisdom. I'm reminded of a story Warren Wearsby told. Phenomenal story. Warren Wearsby says, um, he said he had a secretary. He said the secretary just lost her husband and, and, uh, and, and he passed away or he's about to die. And then she was going blind. She was a senior saint. And she'd been a secretary for a long time. And he asked her, he said, he, he went up to her, he made a comment. He said, I just want you to know, he said, I want you to know that, that I'm praying, I'm praying for you. And she looked at him in the face and she said, what are you asking God to do? <laughs> and it startled him. He wasn't ready for that. He said, I'm asking God to strengthen you. She said, I appreciate that. But pray, pray one more thing for me, would you? He said, Sure. 
She said, pray that I don't waste all this. Pray that I have the wisdom not to waste it. Jim Corbett, a very good friend of mine, when he was with pancreatic cancer, he grew closer to the Lord in his suffering than he'd been his whole entire life. He didn't waste it. He sought the Lord. We need wisdom. Whatever it is God's allowing us to go through tonight, we need wisdom. There's something valuable in your lesson. I don't care how painful it is, Christian. I don't care how hard it is. I don't care how much pressure it is. There is a lesson in it for you. Don't miss the lesson. Would you bow your heads with me tonight as I invite the worship team to come? Every head down, every eye closed. This is going to be invitation time. I ask the Christians to pray for lost people that don't know Jesus.